Um, this year, Innovation Zero is taking up a gear and we want to see action and want to see problems being solved. Um, and that's why we're at the first event in the world to partner with a truly game-changing new startup, Ideonomy. Uh, the Innovation Zero Ideonomy is a collaborative innovation community that will bring people together across sectors to solve problems supported by machine learning and AI. I just so you will see QR codes um, dotted oh. around the event so where you can submit, um, you and rank the most important uh, problems across each forum okay. and we'll create a prioritized list of problems so we know like where to focus on um, to uh, our innovation efforts. Um, after the event, we'll set up a series of new problem solving teams uh, where you can meet people who share the same problems as, the, as you regardless of what sector they originate from. Uh, we'll then connect problem owners to solution providers so we can solve problems together and um, drive positive change. So, yeah, please um, scan the QR code to get going. And um, our, net, our session is Heat Pump Revolution, bringing affordability to the masses. Um, so, yeah, over to you. Um, our moderator is Sam Fitchman, Commercial Director for Heat. Plug me in. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So we've got a quick presentation before we go um, into the panel session, which we're going to run through. So we'll start with, with that. I'm not going to talk through both of these, am I? No, good. OK. So everybody in this room knows that, or everyone that's interested in heat pumps will know that we have a challenge on our hands in meeting the government's target of installing 600,000 heat pumps every year. At Plug Me In, like a lot of businesses, we were new to the heat pump market last year. And so we set about a process of trying to understand the barriers to adoption that exist today, but more importantly, is trying to understand how we could package up heat pumps in such a way that they alleviate customer concerns, increase accessibility, and ultimately drive up rates of adoption. So to do this, we worked with Boston Consulting Group, to design and commission a piece of consumer research. And through this process, we gathered data from 2,000 people. Encouragingly, the res results of this, present, this uh, consumer research paint a really positive outlook for the heat pump market, despite the very clear challenges that we face. So what do we learn from this process, and what insight can we take forward into to developing these products and propositions to alleviate customer concerns? Let's go through them. So 62% of respondents, what we categorized as non-rejectors, they're open to installing a heat pump. When you consider this in the context of a lot of negative media press for heat pumps in the last couple of years, we think it paints a really, really positive outlook for the market. And it shows that if we can find a way to package up products and alleviate the customer concerns that exist today, the market opportunity for everybody in this industry is enormous. Secondly, the key barrier, despite availability of grant funding to installations for heat pumps today, is cost. 56% of respondents cited this as a reason for having not got a heat pump. This tells us that we have to find a way of normalizing alternative ways of managing the upfront cost associated with heat pumps. Design things so that they are the same, same as leasing your car, using a mortgage to buy your house. We need to adopt the same principles for heat pumps. Drivers. The biggest driver today for installing a heat pump is to save money, is to reduce costs. People expect to see a positive return on their investment. I think this represents, unfortunately, quite a big departure from the boiler market, where people accept the cost of a new boiler as a necessity for heating and hot water. But, encouragingly, the second biggest driver to install a heat pump is to be green. So this shows us that we can design products in such a way as they appeal to people's emotions and their desire to do the right thing. We're not solely fighting an economic battle. 70% of people were interested in a financing solution to address that upfront cost challenge. As an ex-banker, I can tell you that banks are not going to lend to every single person down the street for a heat pump. 
and the specialist consumer credit providers that we use for everyday items today will not be able to mobilize the capital at the scale needed to meet this challenge. This tells me that we have to find a way of balancing the risk allocation that sits behind customer propositions in such a way that it facilitates the mobilization of private sector capital at scale. Finally, when we asked people to rank what was most important to them when installing a heat pump, alongside a warm home and a reliable product, they consistently prioritized access to dynamic tariffs. This shows us that we're designing these packages how they interact with consumer behavior and dynamic tariffs will be fundamental to the design and the success of those products. What we've been through here is clearly high level, but the data that sits behind this continues to show there is a pathway to increasing rates of adoption if we can deliver heat pumps as a package and hit three key things. One, we need to remove upfront costs. Two, we need to make sure they pair with dynamic tariffs, allow people to achieve in-life savings through optimizing their behavior with the tariff. And three, they need to deliver a consistent customer experience for the duration of the product life cycle. We need to remove that perceived transition risk from that people perceive when moving from a boiler to a heat pump. So with that, I invite our panel partners to join me and explore with you how we can reflect on this insight deliver these packages, and ultimately drive rates of adoption. Thanks. Oh. Tittle. Bear me one second. And see, that is really good. And, you know, it's a Jewish guy. Okay. So we're going to split the panel um, broadly into kind of three areas. First being able to pay. Um, the second being social housing, and the third being heat pumps in the commercial sector. Um, so to start with, Harriet, um, it's clear from our research that in-life savings arising, arising in connection with dynamic tariffs um, is a key driver for people considering upgrading to a heat pump. How does this resonate with your own customer feedback, and what are Centrica doing to address this? Yeah, no, we've found exactly the same in our own research and the research that you and the team have done is brilliant. It's a big problem. People don't want to replace boilers with something that's much more expensive to buy and is disruptive and then the running costs are more expensive. So what we've done at Centrica, we've brought our heat pump costs down. Our average heat pump install is only £2,000 more than our average boiler install. And actually, when we look at our average heat pump customer, their properties are a lot larger than, than just doing a boiler. And obviously, a boiler is a lot simpler. Um, so we've got costs down from 499. We offer 0% finance for two years to make it easier and more affordable to spread the costs. Um, we're increasing the, the partners we're working with. And mid-May, we will be launching our first heat pump tariff, which will significantly reduce the costs and work to rebalance while we wait for uh, the government to hopefully announce their own plans and consultation. Um, but we can't wait forever for that, and we know there's an election. So in the interim, we're introducing our own tariff that will be for any uh, British Gas heat pump customer and it will um, save around £400 versus the standard variable tariff um, so it will be a, a great incentive um, but yeah you're absolutely right cost is such a big problem it's something that comes up with in every discussion all the research um, that and along with all the disruption um, as well yeah great um and Emily, clearly a key part um, of in-life savings is driven by heat pump efficiency. Yep. Um, what are you think manufacturers can do to give people confidence that the kit they are buying um, is going to deliver this? And, and what are Panasonic seeing um, in the able to pay market that's delivering the most success? Yeah, I think following on from what you've shown is, is the vast majority of people that are fitting heat pumps are doing so from an affordability stance and hoping that it will cost them less money to run. Um, something we've done and we think all manufacturers should be doing is being as transparent as possible about running costs and about efficiencies. Um, last year, we commissioned Stroma to look at our heat pump along with 
the top 10 um, like manufacturers within the industry. Um, we found that we were the cheapest, most affordable to run over the course of a year. But what it has shown is massive variation between manufacturers on running costs. And, and that's really concerning. If you're spending in the able to pay market, as we've said, thousands of pounds to put one of these in, you want to know that you're getting a reliable product that, yes, is energy efficient, but it was also saving you money and has real time. It has a real time difference on your quality of life. So we've seen that massively. And I think we've seen a much bigger transition over the last year with bus um, and with greater understanding within the market, much towards heat pumps being viewed in a replacement sense of people who may not have been looking at heat pumps imminently needing a new boiler and turning around and saying, OK, I'll have a heat pump. Um, and definitely transitioning with that side of the market. So it's a really interesting time to be in heat pumps. It is, certainly horizon within it. And I think, um, you know, as an installer, we've found similar issues with, we want to give customers choice, offer them different manufacturers, but because um, you know, sometimes people are, are loyal to a particular brand, mm. but actually um, we also want to recommend the product that we think would deliver the, the outcome that they're looking for um, without looking to favor one, one manufacturer over another. Um, so sort of those consistent metrics that they perform against, I think is going to be key to, to building confidence in the, in the consumer market. You also touched briefly on the boiler upgrade scheme um, and how that's sort of playing into to removing those upfront costs. And it, it sort of chimes with the, the point I'm making around, we need to remove upfront costs um, and, and the boiler upgrade scheme goes some way to doing that, but we still have, there's still a delta. It's often five, six, seven thousand pounds sometimes if you need other sort of retrofit upgrades. And I think any solution that addresses that in conjunction with the bus, bus scheme will, will prevail. Um, consumer financing is great, but the real thing that will bring costs down um, is in, in increasing that financing term to match the useful economic life of your heat pump. So spreading that cost not over three years, but over 15 years. And that's definitely something uh, Callison, which is it's just a group that Plug Me In is part of, has, has done in the, the metering, the smart metering market. We, 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 we cover the cost of smart meters for the likes of Centrica, other energy retailers, and allow them to spread that cost over 15, 20 years. And we think those learnings can be taken into the heat pump market as well. Um, so on to social housing, and clearly the, f the presentation was focused a little bit on uh, the able to pay and those able to pay consumers, but definitely the same kind of challenges are faced in the social housing space as well. Um, so, so Harriet, coming to you first on, on this, clearly Centrica is a huge service provider for social yeah. housing through your PH Jones business unit. What challenges do you see social housing providers are presenting with when it comes to retrofitting um, their housing stock with air, air source heat pumps and, and what do you think you can do to make it pay for the social housing providers to prioritise installing air source heat pumps? Yeah, I'd say generally social housing is, is quite a big success compared to the able to pay um, because the funding's there and it's been a lot more consistent than the able to pay market. You know, we had the Green Homes Grant, etc. and that disaster, but Boiler Upgrade Scheme's great. Um, but a lot of that, you know, only covers 50% of the costs and a lot of that is taken away immediately with solar and insulation measures. They're not specifically something on heat pumps and it would be great if something could be introduced that focused a certain area of that money on um, heat pumps. Um, a lot of the problems that we've seen are social housing providers not necessarily understanding the technology and then that reaching through to the customers. We really focus on educating the customers and we often find that someone will reject it, but then once they see their neighbor's heat pumps working fine and the other technologies we introduce, they then go, oh, actually, I do want it. And it's a lot of it is the work of, oh, I've gone to one house, that's fine, I will get it. And word of mouth, and I think that that's true across able to pay as well. Um, and I think there is, there's a role to play. I mean, we are working on bespoke net zero plans with the social housing providers so that their sources are all the step the way because we've got so many engineers um, who have worked on this and have done heat pumps for years. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's industry-wide. We just need to work better together with local government, social housing, with, with the customers, um, but also the providers just to make sure that the education and understandings there because people are scared of things that they don't know and scared of change um, but this is good change we just need to explain that 
Yeah, and, and you touched a bit on the, or you touched a lot there on the, the education piece. Do you, what, what do you think, there's a, lot of, there's a lot going on in this space. What do you think we could do a bit differently or we could do more of to educate? And I guess this is a question across, across uh, social housing and able to pay. How could we educate customers more? Do you see it being um, having local community hubs where you run days to sort of take people through yeah. pumps? Yeah, I think stuff like that. You've got um, Nesta have obviously got their new uh, newish project and Desnes have open houses in, apparently in every area um, of the UK. I think it's projects like that so people can go and see the technology. Obviously, we still have the trouble with the cost for a lot of it, but in social housing, that's taken away if you are um, a resident in the property. Um, but I think it's just understanding a lot more and, and, and seeing is the best way to do it and hearing from people um, because you know, Desners has had campaigns, I think that they've had adverts on Sky, that's not necessarily going to be enough to do things, it's about getting everyone involved in this together and explaining in simple terms what's happening because I don't think anyone has been transparent enough with the public about mm. what's going to happen. Because um, there's going to be a big change, whether you have heat pumps, heat networks, potentially hydrogen or biomass or whatever. There's mm. there's a whole education piece that that has been missed. Yeah. And, and Emily, I know social housing in particular is close to your heart. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I know Panasonic work close to social housing providers. Um, how do some of the barriers we've discussed and, and able, in the able to pay market resonate with your experience um, with barriers for the social housing market? And how do you think manufacturers can make rolling out heat pumps more attractive to residents and social landlords? I think as Harriet says, very much social housing is at the forefront of the, um, of the net zero revolution, mainly because it's where we're seeing the vast majority of bulk installs of heat pumps. Um, and that's a massive transition away from individual combi boilers, which, w which have been the bread and butter of social housing installs for the better part of the last 10 years. What we're finding similarly is the education piece is massive. I mean, how many people in this room have a combi boiler and when you get home and it's cold in the winter, you turn it on, you turn it on full for about 20 minutes, you get really, really hot and you go, oh God, it's really warm in here, now I'll turn it off. Rather than looking at heating as a constant space heating and storage of heat, we, it's, it's a very big transition to the way we heat our homes, essentially. Um, and in social housing, how we've managed that as a manufacturer is we've understood that that, that learning curve is quite steep. And we don't want that necessarily to be right the first day when people haven't get into their homes and try to use their heating for the first time. Um, so we work with our community engagement teams within our social housing companies that we work with. Um, and we go around pre, during and after and say, this is what's happening. This is the upgrade. Do you have any questions at this stage that you want to ask? And managing that, that fear and that, that, um, that uncertainty that comes with a massive change. Over the last winter, one of the most common queries we got on these was the fear of being cold and the fear of their energy costing too much and those are real they, those are fears that strike really hard I think into the core of most people's hearts is the fear of your family being cold and the fear of not being able to pay your energy bill and something we've been able to do as heat pump manufacturers is we've actually been able to take away a lot of that uncertainty over winters so all Panasonic heat pumps come with an emergency backup heater so the way we're saying this is and social housing tenants, tenants will, and, and anyone who's ever lived in a, in a rented home will actually understand this, if when your boiler has a problem with it, you call up late on a Friday afternoon, probably about six o'clock, and you say, oh gosh, I've just got home from work, boiler's not working. You phone your landlord, or, or, and they say, I'm so sorry, we can't get someone out to you before this date. With a backup heater and our, and our system, which is smart cloud, you can remotely turn on that heating using the backup heater. So it means that fear and that worry of being cold over the winter, we've been able to dispel. And that's something that's really done as well within social housing. You can get a call on a Friday afternoon, and my backup heater goes on, someone's warm for the weekend, which is a big change, even away from the boiler manufacturers. But that's an education piece. And it all comes back to, as Harriet's been saying, education and understanding. At the moment, heat pumps are this strange new system that sits in the garden it doesn't sit in the home it's 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 weird um and it's that education piece of, of how does it work understanding it understanding how it works with your home and how it can create healthier safer homes to live in um, and that is a transition i think 
as much as we as much as we can, we like to speak with the person that's living in that home um, and getting one to one and having honest human conversations, which there there could be a lot more of, I think, especially yeah. at high level, is speaking to people as as residents and as human beings, because we all have that same worry of, am I going to be warm over winter? And is my heating bill going to cost me? And we're going to have to take our small mortgage for my heating bill next year. So that's yeah. my that's my piece on that. <laughs> okay. And, um, and for, the, for the, the social landlords themselves, mm -hmm. I know a key focus for them, they're nervous about their transition, they want to make sure their yeah. customers are warm, but I know something you guys are focused on is ensuring the ability to monitor their yes, portfolio absolutely. at scale, and that's really powerful for social housing providers. So perhaps okay. you could tell us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, so, so Panasonic Smart Cloud is it's a little box. I wish I'd brought one with me today, but then I would have had my Steve Jobs moment. of It's a little box about this big, um, that is connected to the back of all of our units and all of our social housing installations. Um, and what that does is it means that we're able to remotely monitor and maintain, but also alter our heat pumps remotely. Um, so we can see what our heat pumps are doing, and they're, they're coded on this red, yellow, red, amber, green system. And for monitoring and maintenance for social housing landlords, that's massive. We're, what we're seeing is the, this change to ever-increasing operating budgets with ever-decreasing funding. Um, and the way we've been going about that is, essentially, you can, you, you what's the word, you can proactively maintain your housing stock rather than reactively maintaining. So the green heat pumps are all happy, the amber heat pumps, something's quite wrong, not, not quite right with me, please come and see me, I'd really like it if you had a look at me. Red is, you need to go there today. Um, but 90% of the time, we're able to do that remotely. So user error, which we'll all discuss about heat pumps, um, we've seen some very some very interesting um, learnings out of our first couple of years with, with large-scale social housing installs. There will always be someone that gets into their house, has a, as anyone would, has a play with it, sets it on the, all these different things, and then goes, oh, I don't know how I've done that. I don't know quite what I've done, but I've got no hot water anymore. Um, and ra rather than sending a member of staff to that home, possibly driving a couple of couple, tens of miles, to then go in for 10 minutes, reset it, and come back, we can do that remotely, and it's saving money, it's saving time, and that's why social housing landlords really like it, is you can be a lot more proactive. Yeah, I know as an installer, we're, we're really keen for this technology, because <laughs> you know, we want to provide guarantees and uh, people's certainty on the yeah. installation, and actually sometimes it does require a little tweak, like post-installation. If you could do that remotely, it makes it a lot more efficient for us and able to then offer that sort of premium service for people. So. Next, I just want to sort of talk a little bit about commercial scale heat pumps because the debate is often centered around um, domestic properties in the UK, but clearly decarbonizing our public spaces and buildings is also really important to, for achieving net zero. Um, so, so perhaps Harriet, coming to you, you next, uh, how, how essential are you seeing the demand for, from your commercial customers for these types of products, the commercial scale heat pumps, and, 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 and what are you sort of, do, do you think there is enough focus in the market on from the from the business sector and public sector organizations on, on this area for decarbonization yeah so we have our uh, centrica business solutions uh within under the centrica brand which really focuses on decarbonizing um public sector and commercial and there definitely is a demand um but I think it's difficult because businesses have really struggled in the energy crisis. There's not the regulation that there is in the domestic retail market. And every day we see emails from, from people who, I mean, there's a whole broker issue that goes on in the, in the um, non-domestic electricity sector. And so I think people really do want to do it and we definitely see hospitals wanting to decarbonize and want to install large-scale heat pumps um, and different sections of the military wanting different things but I think that there's still a problem at the moment with the high electricity prices it's the four times cost versus gas um, which and generally um, non-domestic use electricity more than they use gas um, so it's it, it's quite difficult for them at the moment because they've still tied in a lot of them into higher electricity bills than they previously had expected. And so when you're looking at costs, it's it's where does that go? But I mean, there's definitely demand of people want to reach net zero. Mm -hmm. It's just not necessarily right now because there's other um, impending electricity costs that they've got at the moment. Yeah. 
yeah, it's definitely um, it's a tough time for businesses and asking them to spend more money than they might otherwise on, on decarbonisation yeah. is, is a luxury I think a lot of them don't have. Um, so, so, so Emily, obviously, you know, Panasonic, you also manufacture commercial scale heat pumps. How are you seeing the demand for that? How does that compare to the, com uh, the domestic market? Yeah, I think we're seeing a, a very big switch in the way that um, heating and energy has been viewed in this country. So definitely a move towards microgrids, smaller district heating networks. Um, and as we've seen, district heating encompasses a, a wide variety of solutions, and that can be, that can be air source heat pumps. Um, there's been definitely in the space of the last year a very big transition within our space to looking at more district solutions. So um, a couple of our recent installations have been University West of London, Paragon House, um, which is predicted to save, okay, I'll, I will have the numbers if anyone wants to do it, but a considerable amount of energy annually compared to their old system. Um, and the Ritz Hotel in London is also Panasonic. Um, and the reason people, as Harriet alludes to, have been largely doing these is, yes, large companies have ESG targets and net zero targets, but a lot of it comes down to efficiency and comes down to looking for systems that are more efficient to replace their previous systems. Um, we like to think that there is a very good combination of both companies that are ethically focused and also looking at their efficiencies. Um, but as Harriet does say, the current prohibitive price of electricity is preventing a lot more of these installations from going on. But the issue surrounding that is we can't have a mass scale transition to green energy without having more of the grid on electricity. So we're almost stuck in this catch-22 of not it, it not being possible in order to, to continue at the rate that it is because of, of, that, of that stopping point. So until we have more large commercial systems based on electricity, we won't see that prices go down. So we are very much stuck in that space. Yeah, and then we're stuck with the whole grid problem, which everyone Indeed. knows about, <laughs> where you want to, you know, people want to install a heat pump, you have to notify the DNO. So when you yeah. want an industrial one, there's a larger problem there to make yeah. sure you've got a connection. Um, so hopefully yeah. that will get moved on and Ofgem will work it, hard to it, through that. <laughs> it goes back to social, house, social housing. Forgive me, that's my, my job at Panasonic. Um, one of my largest councils um, is aiming to install 700 air source heat pumps this year. They currently have 600 applications sat with DNO. Um, they've had, I think, 40 back. They would do more installations if possible. And that's the, that's the real stopping point for us, I think, is we have organizations that really, really want to decarbonize, that are really pushing forward for the net zero future, and we just need to make sure that at all levels we're supporting them. Yeah, and we have exactly the same problem, social housing as well. Yeah. It's DNO. Yeah, people want heat pumps, and there's you know there's a funding in certain areas, but yeah, grid problems. <laughs> yeah, well, I think actually sort of we're, we're we're timing out now, so we're going to wrap up. But I do I do <laughs> think there's a a connect and notify change occurring from the seventh of May actually, which the government sort of heard these problems. But actually, brings us on to our last thing I want to ask. <laughs> so before we before we call it a day, if there was one call out sort of that you could have of government mm. each, you know, to help us push this forward. Um, what is that? I have a feeling me and Harriet will be very um, aligned on this one, perhaps. You can go first, mine, and then I might come up with something <laughs> you different. You might have to. Oh, thank you. Cause, <laughs> so mine would, mine would be, as we've just said, DNO. Um, we have organisations that are really, really pushing forwards and wanting to install more heat pumps and wanting to contribute to this revolution. Um, but presently, they're being hampered, hampered by grid uh, and, and by DNO connections. So that's, that would be me, is, is to invest in the infrastructure necessary for this transition. I think for me, I completely agree with you. Have I'll go for permitted development rights mm -hmm. because I know, although government are definitely looking at that, and hopefully there'll be something announced in summer, um, that is such a problem in uh, for domestic um, and able to pay consumers, uh, particularly in Wales. I, you know, <laughs> it's just a ridiculous three meter rule. Yeah. Um, not enough people have big enough gardens for that. So I'll go for that. But then obviously rebalancing costs as well as a little a star edition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Well, um, thank you very much, Bose. And uh, if the audience thank just you. join me in thanking our panel partners and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.